Welcome everyone to another main SBDC webinar. This is the second SBDC webinar of today. Uh, and my name is Kelsey Reardon and I'm with the State Office hosted by USM. And we are very lucky to have Christina Ramsdell, who is the newest certified business advisor uh, at AVCOG. So she's a main SBDC at AVCOG business advisor. Um, and I'm, I am not as strong with my acronyms after all this time. So I'm sure she will do a better introduction of AVCOG in a minute. But if you are not familiar with the main SBDC, we are the Small Business Development Centers. And we are here to help small businesses with just about anything you could possibly need. And if we cannot answer your questions, we can find someone who can. And so we're very good at connecting you with resources throughout the state. Um, all of our business advising is of no cost to you. So it's uh, tax funded and grant funded and it's all confidential. So if you are not set up with a business advisor already, all of our contact information will be in my follow up email so that you can easily sign up for that. Today we're going over uh, a kind of behind the scenes look at what banks look for at lo with loan applications. Um, and so Christina comes to us from the banking industry and she has lots of experience. So it'll be fun to hear her perspective, helping from one side of to the other sort of a switcheroo. Uh, and so if you have any questions along the way, just stick those in the chat below. We'll have plenty of time at the end for Q&A if we don't answer your question along the way. Like I said, I will send a follow-up email out later on today, and that'll include a link to the recording of today's session, as well as the slides and any other resources we may mention. So if you have any questions after the fact, feel free to just respond to any email you've gotten from me. Uh, and also Christina's contact information will be in that email as well. Otherwise, I think we're all ready to get started today, so I will pass it over to Christina. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to present to you guys today uh, a behind-the-scenes look at how banks look at loans. But first, I'm going to talk about a little bit about me, who I am, and my background. Um, so who am I? So I'm Christina Ramstall. I'm a certified business advisor here at the Maine Small Business Development Center. I'm located here in Auburn at AVCOG, better known as the Androscoggin Valley Council of Government. Uh, we service the counties of Androscoggin, Franklin, and Oxford, but I have a phenomenal team all throughout the state of Maine. So any advisor can help you from any part of the state. It um, doesn't just have to be me. Um, I have almost 10 years of experience in the retail banking world. I worked as a teller all the way up to branch manager, and I have specific knowledge in lending, um, everything from personal loans, business loans, lines of credits, credit cards, any type of lending I've probably dealt with except for a mortgage. Um, I do a lot of credit counseling, have had a ton of experience in that, and of course I've managed a couple of staff and, and dealt with uh, the management operations of a branch. Um, things I am not. I am not an accountant and I am not a lawyer, so you will not be getting any tax advice from me or legal advice from me in this conversation. We do have resources, though, should you need those. <laughs> so I'm going to jump right on in. Um, this is probably the biggest question that I want to know more information about from, from you folks is, why are you here? Um, most of the questions that you see on the slide are generally things that I run into. So you're probably here because you either think you need a loan, um, you might need a loan, you're not sure if you're going to get approved, you're not sure what the payment would be, or even if you could afford that payment, what kind of loan you need, uh, what information do you need to bring, uh, and do you have to have anything out of pocket? Do I have to have cash on hand? Um, or maybe you've already gone through the loan process and you were denied, and you're really not sure exactly what you were denied for. So it's my goal today to hopefully answer some of these questions for you so that when you walk in or when you do need a bank loan, you can feel very confident and prepared that you know what you need to know for that conversation. So what are banks looking for? So there's really five different categories that a banker looks at when you walk through the door and you ask for any type of loan. And usually it starts with your debt to income, which you'll see me refer to as DTI, um, loan to value, which LTV, 
your credit score, which is usually what most people think of, cash on hand, and then your collateral. All five of these go into kind of the big picture of what an underwriter would consider your risk rating. Um, and they essentially are just looking to make sure you're meeting some policy guidelines in each one of these kind of categories. So any lender that you meet will have gone through this initial training. So I'm essentially going to give you a sneak peek at being a lender. And we talk about the five C's of credit. Five C's of credit are talked about in any different way. There's different names for them. Believe it or not, you wouldn't think there would be. Um, but the five C's are character, capacity, capital, collateral, and conditions. So what does that mean, actually? So character is your credit history. And when I talk about credit history, I'm talking about how long have you had your credit cards for? How long have you had your loans for? What are your balances on your loans? Are you making your payments on time? really talking about any of that pre-existing things that you should be paying on a regular basis. Your capacity is the debt to income. And it really is that simple. It really is comparing the amount of debt you have to the amount of income you have. And does the income that you have meet all of your obligations, your current ones, and is there room to add more? So banks will have a policy that will actually leave you some wiggle room um, and we're going to talk about some clarifying as to what we mean as a banker when we're talking about debt. It's different than what you would think it would be. Capital, cash on hand. How much cash do you have in your account or at your house or somewhere liquid that you could bring in and put down towards a loan? Your collateral, you are only going to see collateral used in a secured loan where the banker is going to take um, a lien position on either equipment, a building, they're using the value of that collateral to give you a loan. Because at the end of the day, if you don't pay, they will come after your collateral. They certainly don't prefer to do that, but that is something that a banker is looking for. And it does make them feel more secure, especially if you don't have perfect credit score or anything along those lines. They really are going to base a lot of this on collateral. Uh, but keep in mind that it's not ever going to be based on just one of these factors. It has multiple uh, factors to be included. Conditions. So conditions, what's the plan? What's the purpose for your money? Like if you're coming in for $10,000, you probably have a reason that you're coming in for that $10,000. I want to know what exactly you're using it for. Is it being reinvested into your business? Is it going to be something that makes you more money in the long term? Because the bank really wants to make sure that what you're investing your money in is going to increase your wealth over long term. This also can have to do with the economic situation. So during the pandemic, it wasn't uh, rare to see somebody ask for what was called a COVID statement, which was basically a statement saying, how did you handle your business during COVID? Did you have to shut down? If you did have to shut down again, how would you pay your employees? Are you prepared for this? A lot of people would answer with, well, I got a PPP money or I got EIDL money. Um, and that's totally fine. They just want to have an understanding of if a disaster should happen along those lines again, how can we kind of better prepare for it in the long run? And I like to include this last 6C of credit. It's common sense, which, you know, might not be as common as we used to think it was. Um, but it, if it doesn't make sense to you as a person, um, do you think it's going to make sense to the banker? Does it seem like a good idea if someone's asking for a ton of money and you don't have any money to put down towards it? Are you going to get a million dollar loan with, with zero cash? Like, is that realistic? Um, so, you know, think about what makes common sense to you um, and use that when you're coming in to present something to your banker. They'll appreciate you for it. So let's dive in a little bit into credit. So this, I literally could do a presentation just on credit. And if any of you need credit counseling, I can definitely help you out with that. I also know a ton of banking friends that can help you out with that too. Um, the biggest things with credit is your payment history and your credit utilization. They are actually factored in higher than anything else that you're doing. And again, that payment history is based on you not having any 30-day lates. But what most people might not know is that we don't actually, or sorry, we, I shouldn't say that I'm not a banker anymore. See, I'm still recovering. Uh, the banks are looking to make sure that they're reporting a late payment, but it doesn't go on your credit until 30 days late. What they're charging you between the 10 day to 30 day is their banker's late fee. It's not your credit that's getting dinged by that. If you go past 30 days, they will report that on your credit. And that does look negatively when you're looking to apply for a new loan. Now, do accidents happen and you have something like that happen? Yes, for sure. It's going to happen at some point. 
Uh, what is best to remember about that is keep that to a minimum as much as possible. If it happens once, a bank may be willing to overlook it, but if it's two, three, four, that's a pattern, and they're not going to be as likely to do a lending for that payment history. Credit utilization is also another thing that's heavily weighted, and it is something that you actually have a lot of control over. It just takes a long time for reporting to show that you've made some improvements. There's two things I usually tell somebody with credit utilization. So if you were just new and you were starting out and getting credit and you got five credit cards, each one of them having a $500 limit and you max them out. So you're at, you know, 450 of each one of those credit cards. Having that much compared to the available limit that you have is a negative factor. You're trying to try to keep it 33% and under is what you want to do for each active line that you have. Otherwise, anything over that, it's actually negatively affecting you. But there's two ways you can fix that. So you can call the credit card company and ask for them to extend you, essentially uh, hire your limit. Um, they will rerun your credit report for this. So this will be a credit inquiry if you decide to do that. But increasing your limit ultimately will give you more availability, which will lower the percentage that you're utilizing on your credit card, unless you go out and spend a lot more money after you've got done the increase. So keep that in mind. Uh, alternatively, if you've got a lump of cash, pay it down. Like if you just run on credit cards, like some of us do because we like the rewards, you just take that cash and you pay it down. You wait a month for it to report that you've got lower balances on those credits, uh, credit cards, credit loans, whatever it might be. They're just looking to see that you are utilizing your credit effectively. The other things are, are relatively minor. Uh, but some tips and tricks here is age of credit. So thinking about the first time you got a credit card or the first time you got an education loan um, or the first time you got an auto loan, whatever that first credit line is that you have, if you close that, it reduces the age of your credit. So I got my first credit card in 2010. It was only $500, but it was something to start my credit building. But after 10 years, I've obviously acquired a few more credit cards. I have a few other, other options. But I'm still going to keep that first one open, even if it's paid off completely. I'm still going to keep it open because it increases the age of my credit history, which is a positive thing to have a longer credit history than a shorter one. Generally, I think it's about 10 years. It's considered um, moderate to good and anything higher than that is better. Anything less than 10 years, it can have a small detraction on your credit card, uh, sorry, your credit um, score, but nothing super major. Types of accounts, kind of like investments, you want to uh, have a variety just so that it doesn't look like you're just doing three credit cards. Ideally, banks like to see like three trade lines. And when I talk about three trade lines, I talk about that can be three credit cards. It can be an auto loan, a mortgage, and a credit card. It can be a line of credit. It can be, you know, anything amongst those. But the bank would really like to see you have a credit card, an auto loan, and a mortgage. You want to know why? Because those three things are completely different. You've got, you know, home, you've got a collateral, you've got collateral on the auto, and then you might have an unsecured credit card. So a variety is always a good thing to have. And then credit inquiries. So this is pretty common. I see this a lot. People are trying to get a credit card or they're trying to get a mortgage and they go to like 10 different places and they run their credit. Uh, you want to try to limit that to three a year. They do fall off after so long, um, but if you have more than three a year, it does look like to the bank that you've had some struggles um, and that you're trying to get somebody to approve you somewhere and something's kind of funky there. Alternatively, there is something to be known about the mortgage. So like when you're going to apply for a mortgage, definitely do your rate shopping. There's all kinds of opportunities there and different programs that banks are running, but it will show up as multiple credit pulls. The theory is, and, and you can always um, send this into your credit bureau and actually dispute it if it becomes an issue, is generally they are supposed to factor in if it's within 30 day period, they'll factor it in as one credit inquiry, even if you went to 10 different banks for mortgages because of that very factor. So keep in mind that if a credit for a score is being reduced because of your inquiries, it may be because you're looking for a mortgage um, within a certain time period and you would want to contact the credit provider to let them know that it was in regards to one mortgage research instead of you were just looking to find a bunch of different loans. Uh, and when's the last time you checked your credit? So before you go into a bank, this is probably one of the first questions they're going to ask you, do you have any idea of what your credit score is? Anywhere between 300 and 850 is usually what I have seen. I mean, you can have no credit um, and you wouldn't be on the score at all, but 850 is the best you can get. You can't get any higher than 850. It's incredibly difficult to get to 850 to begin with. 
Uh, ideally 700 is really the aim. Like that's the, the really ticket item for banks. They want to see 700. If you're at 680, that's not a bad score. I've had people come up to me. I've got a 600. That's a terrible score. It's not a terrible score. It needs a little bit of improvement and it's not that, that hard to make those changes. I always recommend that you pull your credit report once a year. You do get that once a year for free. Uh, at the end of the slide, so you will actually see a resource page that will give you that website. If they ever charge you for it, do not proceed, you are in the wrong place. So that's credit. We're gonna to move to debt to income. Uh, this is something super duper simple. You can figure this out on your own before you even walk into a bank. And hopefully your lender, if you're sitting down with one, is doing this for you before they're putting in an application. Because as soon as they put in an application with your signature, you're gonna end up with your credit pulled. If you know your debt to income is not gonna meet their policy, then you do not wanna put in an application just to have a credit pull on you. So in this debt to income, I've actually put a scenario here. When we're talking about debt, I'm not talking about your telephone bill, I'm not talking about your electricity bill, your TV, any of that. I'm talking about the things that are gonna show up on your credit report. So most of those things don't show up. I think sometimes cellular bills will occasionally show up depending on how they report it. Um, but you wanna make sure it's anything that's reporting on your credit, which the bank will know because when it puts an application in, it's gonna pull your credit and see exactly what you have reporting. In this situation, for an example, I have a mortgage, somebody's got a credit card or two, they've got an auto loan, and then they've got a personal loan. So they've got a snowmobile or a tractor or, or some other type of toy that they would like to um, have as a personal loan. This ultimately is the payments that they're making. So $1,200 to their mortgage, 500 to auto. Um, credit cards are factored on a minimum payment. So even if you owe $5,000, they're factoring your monthly debt to income based on your minimum payment. But if you owe $5,000 and betting your minimum is probably closer to $100, then usually the $35 that you're seeing for smaller balances. And then we've got a personal loan for $600. This is not far off. This is pretty you know, common. Maybe the $600 loan might be a little steep. You have to have a pretty good toy for that. But um, when you add up all of these debts, you get to $2,450. Now let's look at income. So income is based on a pre-tax uh, value when it comes to a bank. So if you're getting a salary, that's what they're basing it off. Now, they're not basing it off of your after-tax that you get as a paycheck. So in this scenario, you've got somebody who's got, we're doing an individual at this point, um, a $60,000 salary. You divide it by 12 to get their monthly because you are using this based on monthly debt. And your debt to income is that monthly debt divided by your monthly income. And that gives you a percentage. So you have you know, 0.49, which is 49% which just means that your debt compared to your income is 49% of your income. That doesn't leave you a lot of wiggle room. The reason why the banks have it at 45% or roughly around there, you will see up to 50%. You will see some variation on this debt to income, but generally between 40 and 50, uh, they are leaving wiggle room in for living expenses. They don't want to calculate it in debt to income because they've already calculated it as leaving that available for you to use whatever you need for your gas, for your food. There are things that they're not going to talk about that they're leaving that open money for. Same scenario of debt, but this person makes $75,000. Again, divide by 12, you get your monthly income. This person actually has 39% of debt to income. And keep in mind that this isn't including any further loans. This is just their current debt obligations. So when they go to add a loan, they're going to have to factor that new payment in as the debt. So in this particular case, because it's 39%, they can afford a loan payment of 350 and so you can figure this out. There's a couple of different ways to figure out your loan payment. Um, you can even use like bankrate.com is a very popular website. It's got a lot of payment calculators that you can just type this stuff in. If you know the amount that you want for a loan, the interest rate, it will and the term, it will factor the payments for you. Um, in this scenario, like I said, 350 plus the current debt and what they have for income, they'd be at 0.44% this particular person has a better chance of approval than the person who's only making $60,000. So let's talk about individual versus joint applications because that's another thing that we see a lot in the banking world. Um, there are benefits and downsides to each. As an individual applicant, you need to be aware that it's factoring based on one income, it's factored on your one credit score, but if you have any joint debt, with your husband, your kids, your friend, that's gonna be factored in as if you're making the full payment, no matter what. Unless you have that other person on this loan with you, they are factoring it as if you were the only person responsible for that loan, which can make that a little tough for some married 
uh, income households where one of them makes money and maybe the other one doesn't, but the other one needs a vehicle. You're gonna need to have that other significant other on there in order to get that vehicle approved at a bank. On the flip side, I have had situations where we've had joint applicants, but one of the applicants has way more debt than they maybe should. Um, situations where you've got a lot of credit card debt on one of the individuals, but you don't have any credit card debt on the other. You have to factor it in, it's two incomes, it's both of your debt, it's all the debt under each of your names. So if your husband doesn't have as much debt, but you're, you as the wife have a lot of debt, it actually might make more sense that your husband apply individually for a loan under based his income than to have you on the loan because you could negatively affect the chances of getting that approved. The other thing that's important to do with this, and a lot of people don't understand this, is that good credit does not balance out bad credit. So if someone's got a 300, but you've got someone who's also got a 780, having them apply is not going to give them a better chance of getting a loan because there's still that history with that person having bad credit. It doesn't make the bank feel that that's not a risky situation, uh, but good credit can balance out no credit. So you've got your kids, they're just recently starting out, for example, they've got no credit. They've never had anything in their name. You'll see this a lot with parents and they will end up on the application, especially for auto loans, with education loans. Um, and when they go out to get their first big loan, they need to have their parent on there with them so that they can start establishing some credit. So what's the difference? You can also have, as a joint application, you can have a co-signer and a co-borrower and nobody knows the difference. <laughs> and even in banking, it's still a little, touch and go. So I'm going to try to explain this in the simplest way that I can. A co-signer is just as responsible for making the payments if the primary borrower does not pay, but none of their information was used in actually approving the loan. So they didn't pull their credit. They didn't use their debt to income. What they are using is that you have another person on there who can pay this loan, who's legally required to pay this loan, if you as the primary borrower do not. And again, you see this a lot with kids that, you know, maybe the bank wants to give them a loan because they're, this is their third trade line, but they would feel a lot better if they had a co-signer on there with them. Co-borrower, you are just as responsible as the primary borrower. There's essentially no difference. You were two primary borrowers and you were just as responsible and your information was used in decisioning that loan. Loan to value is used just in those secured collateral loans. Uh, typically, this is where we run into a lot of questions from customers because banks don't like to finance 100%. You can find some that will, but it does depend. Most of them, you're talking 80 to 85%. When I say that, I mean, if you were to take out a loan for $100, the bank would give you 85 bucks, you need to give them 15 bucks in order for them to feel more comfortable. The reason why a bank will not finance 100% is if for whatever reason you get the loan and then you just stop making payments on it, it's going to cost them money to hire an attorney to do the fees of getting back the collateral. Uh, it may be that they have to hire a tow truck. They want to factor in for the fees that it would take them to reacquire the collateral and then resell it because a lot of the times it's going to take time, it's going to take energy. So that's what that 15 to 20% is. And don't be surprised if this changes. So there are certain circumstances where this could even go to 30% just because of the economic environment that we're in. The more cash you can put down, the better chances are for approval. I'm gonna give you um, some assistance on this when it comes to down payment, because not everybody has cash on hand, uh, but I just wanna finish up a little bit more about the value and how we figure that out before I give you kind of tips on where you might find some additional financing to cover that. Uh, a loan is usually based off the of fair market value. So anytime that you've ever looked up Kelly Blue Book uh, on your vehicle, or sometimes you use NADA, that's factoring in the depreciation on your vehicle, because we all know vehicles depreciate and it doesn't take a lot of time, um, because the bank's never going to lend you more money than what your collateral is worth. So if your car is depreciated from $10,000 to $7,500, you can bet the bank's probably going to do $6,000 or maybe $6,500 of that particular vehicle, uh, depending on what add-ons and additional collateral you might have. Uh, skin in the game. So again, that goes back to we want to make sure that you are as into this loan as the bank is. Um, the more money you are putting into this and the more you're attached to this collateral, the more likely you are to pay. 
Uh, like I said, the bank is not in this for the collateral. The last thing the bank wants to do is take your collateral. They would much prefer that they did the research to make sure that you can afford the payments and you make the payments and pay them interest over the long period of time because that's how they make their money. Uh, in business, it's very typical to see an all business asset lien. So this is where a banker will come in and say, we're taking it all. We're not just taking the building, we're taking all of your inventory, we're going to take your accounts receivable, we're going to take all your equipment, it's all lumped in. These are usually for your bigger loans, you may also see them for like lines of credit because they are unsecured, so the bank is just trying to mitigate the risk. If they can acquire everything and sell it, that's a different story. I will say in situations like industry specific, if you're having a convenience store, the bank doesn't want your chips. It doesn't want your soda. It doesn't want your edible or disposable items. They want to see you. They want your pizza machine. They want your cashier machine. They want your gas stations. The things that are going to be harder for you to pick up and move and do something with. Um, doing a property and determining that value, it's an appraisal. Pretty typical. Those are pretty expensive. But keep in mind, if you're paying for an appraisal, that's your appraisal. That's not the bank's appraisal. That is your appraisal. Because anytime that you are paying for an appraisal, that is your ownership of that. Most banks will not accept third-party appraisers. So keep that in mind. While you might want to know the value of a building before you purchase it, if you do an independent appraisal and pay for that, the bank's unlikely to use that in their decisioning. They want an unbiased appraisal of it, and they can't guarantee that yours was one. Uh, bill of sale is also a good way that some people can determine value, especially the smaller loans. Again, talking about those toys that you might have, the four-wheeler, the snowmobile, um, things that they can get value off of by Googling the exact VIN number or the exact uh, details of that particular item. Uh, a bill of sale may be, so, uh, may be enough for them to say, yeah, we're just going to base off the bill of sale. They said it was worth $3,000. It's close enough for us. We will take the bill of sale as value. And then when you're talking about valuations as far as acquiring businesses, we use projections and valuations. Valuations of an existing business, we like to use historical data, meaning using their previous tax returns. So depending on how the previous owners have run the business could depend on what they can actually sell that business for in the long run. Ideally, you want to make sure that if you're planning on selling your business, that you're thinking about that three years ahead so that you've got three years of tax returns that show as much profit as you can so that you can sell that business for the most profit that you can doesn't mean you can't get it sold. It just may mean that you may end up having the cash offer because a bank is going to be a harder financing option for you. So cash on hand. I'm not going to go into this a lot because it's pretty simple. We want to see generally 20% down. Again, some, were, some are even requesting 30%. Uh, pretty simple. If you're looking for a $100,000 loan, you want to make sure you've got $20,000 in the bank to put down towards that. And keep in mind, the bigger the loan is, the more reserves that you would want to have. So not only would you need the $20,000 for the down payment, they'd also want to see you have additional savings in the account, like $15,000, because the bank also doesn't want you to have an emergency and not be able to pay for it. Believe it or not, the bank is really looking out for your best interest. They want you to do the loan. They, they want that interest. They really do. But they don't want to put you in a bad situation. It's only going to get worse. The other thing to keep in mind is that the cash on hand you're paying isn't always going directly towards paying down the loan. It could be going to fees. There's quite a few fees, especially when you're talking secured. Um, the appraisal that I talked about is one of the fees that's usually lumped into your closing costs. You may have a doc prep fee, which is essentially just paying the bank to do the paperwork. Anywhere from 250 to 450, maybe even sometimes higher. I've been out for you know four months now, so it could have changed just because of the economic environment. Um, but some other common fees are UCC filing fees, which are basically a lien on your equipment. Um, you may have some recording fees because you're doing the deed, which is at the Registry of Deeds, and they determine what fee they charge to do recordings. And some institutions may even do a credit check fee. Um, so they'll have you pay just so they can check your credit. So wait, I need to have money to get money? Yes. <laughs> The short answer is yes, you do need to have some cash down. There are situations where you win like smaller loans and think anything under 10,000, ideally. That's where you're not going to be as concerned about having some money down um, unless you're doing, like I said, the loan to value with some secure collateral. If you're looking at a line of credit, for example, under 10,000, they're not going to be basing on collateral. They're going to be basing it on your credit score and income. 
So where do you fill in the gap? How do I get cash on hand? So what if you did have an emergency and you needed to fix your roof and you used up all your emergency funds to fix that roof, but now your car's broken and you need a, not a loan, but you don't have any cash to put down. Not you're wiped out. This is where gap financing comes in, but gap financing is only there if you have the wiggle room in your debt to income. So if you are at that 45% for this new loan, gap financing is going to be tough to fill in. If you're at 40% with the new loan, gap financing can fill in an additional 5%. It's just going, you're going to be, you're going to have two loans. You're going to have one with the bank and then you're going to have one with other providers. And in the next slide, I've given you some people that I know will fill in the gap for you. There's actually a lot more than you would think. And as a banker, I will tell you that I didn't know all of the resources available to me. So it's important that you reach out to SBDC or any of these other services, and they would be able to tell you specifically what they would have to offer. Because each one of them has, has a different program. Uh, as you can see on the top, there's APCOG. So we actually do gap financing here. Uh, Jamie Barad is our loan officer and we do, you know, micro loans. We do working line of capital. We'll do equipment loans. Um, we love to see someone come in with a bank approval that has a stipulation that they need XYZ amount to put down. Well, you're approved at the bank. That's the hardest part. You've got that out of the way. We're much more likely to be able to fill in those small differences. We don't typically do big dollar amounts when we're talking gap financing uh, here at AVCOG. I think 50,000 is really where we're most comfortable uh, or under, of course. Uh, but some of these other institutions don't have as much restrictions on that. So we've got CEI, Community Concepts, GPCOG, which if you're wondering if it's a variation of AVCOG, it is, but it's the Greater Portland. So you'll find that there's a lot of COGs um, that are in different areas throughout the state of Maine. And they all have a different something COG at the end of them. Uh, NMDC, EMDC, the town office, FAME, which is the Financial Authority of Maine, and that's actually in Augusta, uh, and the Chamber of Commerce. Even the Chamber has its own amount of money that they can divvy out. And I will say when it comes to gap financing, if you're doing something that's going to have an effect on your community, like you are, you're adding jobs, you are creating more income for people, you are developing a service that is so needed, like daycare is a really good example, right? We need daycare in Maine. Uh, these are places that can really help you because you have a community impact. It's a huge uh, thing to be able to walk into a bank or gap financing and say, this is the impact I'm going to make. So loan policy, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this because every single institution you go to is going to be very different. It's going to require very different things. Generally, again, it's all about DTI, it's all about credit score, that stuff's all the same. But these numbers, that's the 680, 720, 620 to 680, these change all the time. They could change monthly because the bank will constantly look at what the risks are out there and change this number based on what there is. So unsecured loans, they generally request that you have a higher credit score because it's an unsecured loan. If you don't have a good credit score that makes them feel like your character is really good at repaying unsecured loans, unlikely to get approved. If you have a secured loan, you can have a lower credit score and it can, can work out just fine because they have collateral to make up the difference. And again, assuming you've got cash on hand, all of this is multi-factored. So you have to have all the pieces of the puzzle in order for it to fit together and make a nice picture. If you're missing a piece, which if you're like me, nothing irritates me more than missing one piece at the end of a puzzle, you're just not going to be able to get that next financing, that next thing that you need. And again, call every institution. Don't have them run your credit, but ask them these policy questions. They will be able to answer them for you. So the most common types of business loans that I see or did see um, is a working capital line of credit, which is most times revolving, just like a credit card. So you pay it down on it when you can, you can reuse it as you pay it down. Um, overdraft lines of protection, same type of thing. They're smaller and they are primarily connected to your account in the case that you overdraft, but you can use it as a line of credit should you need to. These type of revolving lines are phenomenal when you need to do inventory or anything along those lines. But keep in mind, a bank can call on that loan. And what does that mean? So if you have a line of credit out there for two years and you've been making the minimum payments and you really haven't been making any payments towards what you've used, the bank can call you up 
and say, you've got 30, 60, 90 days to pay off this complete loan balance. Otherwise, we are going to send this to collections because the bank in your closing documents will make sure that you have understood and signed that you are aware that you need to pay down. Most of these capital lines uh, and lines of credits are asking you to pay a percentage of the outstanding balance. So normally 3%, 6%, and you're never gonna have a set payment. So it's always gonna be a different payment. Unlike your term loans and your mortgages, you know what your monthly payment is and you know the due date that it's gonna come out on and you know when you're gonna be done ideally. So you've got a term, you've got an interest rate. Usually all of that is fixed and you're not worried about any changes to it. And then business credit cards, again, those operate very similar to a working line of capital. Most people have a business credit card. If they don't have a working line of capital, their business credit card is their working line of capital. So they're going out and spending everything on their business credit card. But keep in mind, you want to keep your business stuff separate from your personal stuff. Do not use your business credit card for personal things. <laughs> it's never a good idea. And then SBA loans. So we get that, we got that a lot at the bank. Well, what's an SBA loan? Who do I have to go to? Do I have to go to the SBA? No, <laughs> an SBA loan is actually done by the SBA, but it's not something that you directly as an individual can request. You need to go to an approved lender who is working with the SBA, who can give you that loan. And on this next slide here, I've got a number of people here in Maine who are the most active SBA lenders. Um, we've got some really good resources that are both local here in Maine. And then you'll also notice there's some banks that aren't even in the state, but they are active SBA lenders in the state. Um, so don't think that the bank has to be in the state in order to do an SBA loan for you. It's more common for sure. Um, but these are really the people that you would see have the most familiarity if you were to walk in and say, hey, I want an SBA loan. What does that need? These are the people who are most common and used to that kind of request. And at the bottom here, this is the link in which you can go and find other SBA lenders. So if you don't like any of these top rated options, you can go find some other institutions or you can just do your research and see if your bank, the one that you're using right now is an SBA lender. So what you should bring, this is pretty typical for any loan, personal, business, mortgage. And if you've ever done a mortgage, you know they require a stack that's this big of documentation. Um, normally, two years personal and business tax returns. You need to provide all of your business tax returns, not just the one that you want your business loan for, all of them. The reason why that is, is the bank wants to make sure you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul which if you're not familiar with that reference is you're taking money from your good business and you're supporting your bad business with your good business's money. Uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with that and also don't want to give all of their tax returns, especially if they've got multiple businesses, but you do need to provide those. A uh, personal financial statement, it's not that scary. It, every bank has their own personal financial form. It's just your income and it's your debt. So this is the opportunity that I think people miss out most on because they don't put their assets. Anything that you have that you don't have a lien on can be an asset. So if you have snowmobiles and vehicles and all of that stuff that don't have any liens on it because you're a cash guy, then those can be considered assets. Don't forget to include your 401k, your investments, your IRAs, money that's not necessarily liquid but you still shows that you have savings. So God forbid the worst happened, you would have an alternative to be able to use. Uh, they may also request statements from your bank. So if you've got money at a bank that you're not looking to do the loan with, be prepared that they might ask for three months worth of statements to make sure that you have money in that account to pay for debt because they do not have access to your other bank accounts. They don't pull that on the credit. So if you've got money somewhere else and they don't know about it, you, you're gonna have to provide proof that you do. Recent pay stub, so that's if you have changed jobs because taxes are only on a yearly basis. So they're verifying to make sure you haven't changed to part-time. They're verifying to make sure you haven't changed jobs completely um, and make a different salary. That recent pay stub is literally just to verify that. Bill of sale, anything you're doing for equipment and building, you need to provide what they want for it and how much you're willing to pledge. Uh, and then also you need a signature from the buyer and the seller on this particular agreement. Work contracts. So if you have state of Maine work contracts, they're phenomenal. Bankers love them. They're guaranteed money because they're legally obligated to pay you regardless. Uh, so keep in mind that if you have work contracts like plow contracts, bring them in because we are more than happy to look at those work contracts and see if it's something that they can factor into your income in the long run. 
business plan. So this is where the SPDC is phenomenal. We can help you with your business plan. If you're not sure where to get this money, do the business plan, work with us to do the business plan. We can help communicate to a banker where the opportunity is here. And ideally a banker is really looking at your projections. When I talk about projections, it's your income statement, your balance sheet and your cash flow. Cash flow is huge. So if you are the red every single month, that's gonna be a problem. Um, and we can talk about ways that we can fix that and ways that the bank's gonna look at that three years and see what's gonna be your most beneficial year. And the last thing is keep an open mind when you hear a denial from a bank, do not accept that as the end of the conversation. That's the end of the conversation today. It's not the end of the conversation forever. You can talk to a new banker, or if you like the one that you're working with, have them explain to you what the problem was. Was it your credit? Was it the debt to income? They are supposed to tell you what exactly you were denied for so that you can make the improvements in six months to a year. Um, most bankers will tell you to come back in a year. It doesn't always have to be a year. It depends on how much effort and what exactly was the issue. So just keep that in mind, open mind, be willing to ask questions and don't be upset. If you get upset with your banker, the conversation ends relatively quickly. They're not there to make you make your life harder. They want to help, but they need you to tell them how they can help. So I make money, but I don't show it on my taxes. Very, very, very common here in Maine. We've got a lot of sole proprietorships and you wanna know what, it's not wrong, but it's also not right. So when you're doing a write-off, it's great because you're avoiding the taxes that you have to pay in. And sometimes you might pay a decent amount of taxes, especially if you're you know, a new startup and you have to find ways to make money in the first year. It's okay to have a write-off, but it's not okay if you have a write-off that's giving you a net loss and then you come to the bank and want a loan. Why is that? Because a net loss to the bank says you're losing money. We can't lend money to you if you're losing money. So keep that in mind when a banker is looking at you, it's not that you don't make money. It's not that they don't believe you either. They do believe you. They know exactly what you're doing. But if your accountant is telling you this with not knowing that you're looking to get a loan, they're going to advise you to do write-offs. They're going to advise you to pay as little in as taxes as possible. Nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't need a loan in the next two years. Net profit, net loss, just like I said, it's just determining if you have one, if you have a loss, it's going to make it incredibly difficult to get a loan. Net profit is what they're basing it off of. So keep that in mind that that net profit number you see at the end of your tax returns, that's going to be the big factor for your bank. And then rental income. I saw that a lot too, because we have a lot of people who buy investment properties and get what's called passive income. Passive income is when you do something that allows you a stream of income, but requires very little time and energy on your part. You may have had to put up a lot of money to get the building and put a lot of energy into that. But after that, you've rented it out. You've got a stream of money coming in. But if you don't report that you have a rental income, you're not going to get credit for that either. So keep in mind that everything that you want to be able to use for income needs to be shown on paperwork. The bank doesn't, doesn't work in figurative land um, like we do when we're doing kind of projections and stuff. It needs to see the hard proof on paper. And lastly, there's just a couple of resources here that I personally use. Like I said, bankrate.com is phenomenal. I use that for a lot of things. If I'm thinking about refinancing or I'm thinking about what interest rates are, I use that a ton. Uh, annual credit report, make sure you get that once a year. It doesn't always give you the actual credit number. It's more about what's showing on your credit as far as inquiries and uh, loan reporting. So that's where you're going to see if you have 30-day late. That's where it's going to see if there's anything in collections. If you have anything in collections, pay it off. I know the situation may not be ideal. You may not want to pay it off. As long as you have that in collections, it's going to be a negative thing on your report and it's going to make it incredibly hard to grow your credit. Um, but it's surprisingly, once you pay it off, your credit increases pretty quickly. It's not a hard thing to do uh, other than the painfulness of taking the cash and actually paying whomever is collecting on you. Medical bills are kind of an exception here. They aren't looked at as strongly as other types of collections are, rightfully so, because we've all had emergencies before, but they like to try to keep those as minimum as possible. So, you know, you have more than three collections or depending on the amount of the collections, that could be uh, a no-go for the bank depending on how they look at collections. But again, bank specific. So depending on who you're using, that's gonna depend on what their requirements are for the uh, collections they're willing to accept. 
Last and foremost, this is the questions page. So if you have any questions about this conversation, about any conversation, because SBDC covers a ton of different topics um, from anything from, you know, marketing, human resources, target market research, business planning, financials, again, anything that's not uh, taxes or legal advice, we are pretty much the place to go. Uh, and you can go to the website mainsbdc.org. There's this nice orange button in the top right that you can go ahead and select and request any advisor. And again, depending on where you are in the state, that may determine who you actually end up with, but you can also request specific advisors by going through the request for advising. And last but not least, our YouTube channel is phenomenal. I highly advise that you go take a look at it. Uh, I've learned a lot of what I know from the SBDC on our YouTube channels. Um, and again, you'll get to meet some of our phenomenal advisors who are super goofy, super fun to deal with. Um, so just highly recommend that you take a second and look at the material there and see what applies to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christina. Uh, we did have a couple questions in the chat, mostly from Ann P. Um, and are you interested in unmuting yourself and possibly giving us a synopsis? Not to put you on the spot, but uh, I want to make sure that sure. your question is sure. answered. Sure, I yeah. was just, um, you know, um, exchanging emails or whatever with um, somebody who was it, I don't know. Anyway, um, I'm interested in getting a long own um, to remodel a kitchen, which is part of two business enterprises. And I currently have a home equity at 2.75. And I need more money than I've got in the home equity. I need probably about double what I've got in the home equity. Um, so I was directed to several calculators. And I think probably the best thing I'm thinking at this point is... I've got one credit card that's 8% that I've got, I think, 13, 14,000 credit limit on. Um, and I think probably what would be bad. And then I think I can probably set aside three to 5,000 this summer. Um, so I think between the credit card and the um, home equity I've already got, um, and then some savings, I think that should cover my, just about cover my 40,000 that I think I need. So that's what we were talking about. <laughs> All right. As long as you're, you got some answers. Yeah, I saw I David was, David was providing some stuff. He's I from did. Camden thank National Bank. Thank you very much. Right? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you to him. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're all in cahoots. Camden National Bank was uh, on that list of SBA loan providers. So um, it's great getting a lot of, perspective on these things because obviously every bank and every lender and every reviewer is looking at things a little bit differently. Um, so getting a thorough calculator certainly would help. Being able to factor that debt to income and in, like you've got some cash on hand. So now that you kind of have the tool, you can figure out what you might want to lower on your credit card. So it, it depends. It's all big picture, right? So being able to say you've got one credit card with a, a good limit um, doesn't necessarily, you know, end all conversation because who knows what else you might have out there, but being able to factor that minimum payment in. So if you've got 14,000 that you're using and that's your full limit, it's going to be a negative factor. But if you're 33% or less on that credit card, it's not going to be as negative of a factor for the banker coming in and looking at it. And yeah, I noticed in the comments, she was saying there as a seasonal business, they have uh, more cash flow during different times of the year. And so yeah. you'll want to take that into consideration. I'll also just take a moment, give a plug for uh, Rainer Large's upcoming financial projection series. So it's going to be like the Tuesdays and Thursdays for most of June, um, I believe from 1 to 2 p.m., but I might be wrong about that. I'll look it up. Um, and he does a really good job of going through every single thing that you would need to consider with your financial projections for a year. Um, and so if you're looking to take a loan out, this would be something that he would, like you would consider with all of that. I believe it's an afternoon. 
And even if you're an existing business, I highly recommend a cash flow because it's not something that uh, typically that I see a lot of business owners being particularly familiar with and almost intimidated by. Um, but a cash flow is as simple as knowing what you're selling and what those sales receipts are monthly, how much it costs you to sell that item, so your cost of goods sold, and then any fixed expenses that you have. So it's really super simple. And again, we're here to work with you. So go listen to Rainer. And then if you have specific questions, come back to any of us as advisors and we're going to work through them one-on-one -on -one with you. Exactly. It gives you an opportunity to put together those uh, those numbers uh, and then you can get more specific from there. Uh, his cash flow session is like a bonus session at the end. So you, it's like the fifth session. However, uh, Carver Memorial Library in Searsport is asking Main SBDC at CEI Business Advisor and McLaney to do a cash flow projection session that's just that on June 14th. And that's from 12 to 1. But Rainer's uh, sessions are from 1 to 2. And they're Tuesday and Thursday. It's like June 7th through the 21st. So it's five back to back in the month. So yeah, we highly recommend. Uh, you can't, I, he says something, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's like, you don't, you don't know where to go if you don't know where you came from or something. It's like, you, you need a map. Even if you're making up the map to get started, you got to go somewhere. So this is a good place to start. Awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in, but if anybody has anything, feel free to plug it in or unmute yourself. We've got a couple minutes. Um, we did record the session, and so I will send out the link to that YouTube channel and the slides, and I think that's it uh, later on today. So keep an eye out for that follow-up email. It will also include all of our contact information, including Christina's email. We're getting thank yous in the chat. Great job, Christina, all around. I know it's hard to believe, but this is actually her very first webinar with Maine SVDC. So well done. Never would have guessed. Uh, so we are so thankful for everyone who joined us today. More... Uh, well, we got clapping emojis and more thank yous coming in all around. So either that or David has raised his hand, but we're going to, we're going to assume that he's clapping for you as we all are. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Clap claps all around. Uh, so good job, Christina. We are looking forward to future webinars and we hope that you'll all join us in the future as well. And otherwise, have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thanks, guys.